Okay, the first thing I want to do is pick out the wood. And these are all exactly the same size. One side is unfinished and they're labeled. And then the other side has finish, which is just Birchwood Casey True Oil. That's kind of my preferred go-to finish. Uh, it's typically used for gun stocks, but I think it works really great on some of the darker woods, especially like walnut and cherry. These are the ones I'm looking at. Um, there's two variations of white ash. There's cherry, black walnut. This is an odd one you really won't see anywhere. This is ironwood or eastern hop horn beam. And lastly, hard maple. So far what I'm thinking is I have uh, some interesting pieces of walnut laying around. And let me show you the plaque that I'm gonna use. So this is the plaque and I, I quite like that shape. So we're gonna try and match that. Take a look and see what that looks like. And if the walnut looks good, I think we're gonna go with that. First, I'll make a rough outline of the plaque. That way I can take it to the bandsaw and trim off the excess. Since the board is too wide for my jointer, I'm going to simply skip plane it. So the more cup I can take out of the board, the easier it will go. Now that the plaque has been surfaced at the planer, I will trace it again with a pencil. And this time at the bandsaw, I will try to cut within 3 16 inch of my tracing. Using the original plaque as a template, I will use a pattern bit at the router table to copy it exactly. The bit that I'm using is a white side UDC 9112. It's a 7 8 inch helical compression bit and it does an amazing job. I think that looks really good um, for this skull. That first bear was a female black bear, 235 pound live weight. This bear is a 578 pound black bear. I think I need to make a bigger plaque. Pardon me while I dig through my drawers for a moment. Closer. There we go. Let's see. In order to make a larger plaque for the larger skull, I'm going to use this time-tested woodworking trick. Taking a washer from the parts drawer and a pencil, I can make a larger tracing. Now you will notice that it tends to round over the corners, so I will need to be careful at the bandsaw to leave some sharp corners and not follow my tracing exactly. Next, I'll clean up the profile on a spindle sander. Refining the profile with the spindle sander means the plaque won't be perfectly symmetrical, but Having multiple spindle sizes means it will be pretty close. I got a bunch of plaques made. I got two big ones. I'll use one as a template. I have a standard size one. Here's the original I patterned it off of. And there's a slightly smaller one for that one. Don't tell dad. And then, yeah, so four skulls, five plaques. Two are gonna be templates. The two holes originally used to attach the pattern to the plaque are being drilled to final size. This is the half inch hole for a double that will hold the skull on the plaque. I'm trimming the half inch white ash dowels to length 
These doubles were made using a router table jig, and I made them last year for a project. Since it's snowing outside and we're in the middle of a blizzard, I'm going to use what I have on hand. A quick round over finishes the plaque. Well, there's the maple right there. Yeah, no. I want hard maple for the hanger. Um, shoot, I don't know. I might have to use curly maple or maybe ash or elm. I might take a closer look over there. Turns out all my hard maple, aside from being fairly well picked over, is in a lumber pile outside covered in snow in a blizzard. So for now, I think my best option is to use some birch. Let's talk about safety. There are many ways to put a radius on a piece of wood. Standing it up and putting it through a spinny bit running at the speed of death is usually not the best one. However, this works because of two things. If you look at the block, you'll notice the top references against the aluminum fence. It never falls into the gap between the two nylon inserts. Also, I have a pusher block behind it, which supports the piece and prevents tear out, also giving me fine control. All right, so I'm just gonna find center. Okay, so there's center, and I will find this center now. So I'll use my first center line now in the fence. There we go. And I will lock the fence down. And now I can use the other center. and I'll set up my stop block. And I have a second stop block. So now we can slide it to the side and set that second one. And this is kind of a neat trick. Okay, we'll make the first hole. By using two stop blocks, I am able to batch out all five parts without having to measure. This piece attaches the wall plaque to the skull plaque. The first thing I'm going to do is find the exact center and mark it out. Next, I drill a pilot hole. The wall plaque then gets attached with a single screw. Flipping it over, I use a square to check alignment. Once everything is lined up, I use a drill with a different size drill bit spinning in reverse. This marks the center of the hole. With the two additional holes marked, I now drill the two final pilot holes. And now I'll repeat this four more times. Laying out and drilling the holes for the skull plaque is very similar.
The only difference this time is that I can't use a square to check alignment. So I've drawn a line down the center of the plaque and I use that to line up the block. So now that the next few steps are a repeat of what basically just happened, this is the part in the video where I'm supposed to say something thought-provoking to make you think, wow, that's interesting. So as I sit here in the middle of a blizzard the day before Christmas, looking out my window, I'm reminded of an old Uper proverb. Uper, referring to Upper Michigan, where I live. Our roads are some of the most exciting roads in America. Not because they are windy or scenic necessarily, but because it's always snowing and we don't use much salt. We do use the occasional bit of sand though. Anyway, the proverb goes like this. When the weather is bad and the roads are generally horrible, the faster you drive, the sooner you'll be off them. With the plaque constructed, I'll now work on the wall mount. First thing is to make a strip to mount on the wall. I'm cutting a 30 degree curve into the wall plaque. Instead of using a dado blade to speed this up, I'll be making a lot of small cuts. I find this provides less tear out and is not that hard to clean up afterwards. Since the kerf for the wall cleat extended to the center of the plaque, I will need to counterbore this screw hole. Using a router plane and a series of shallow cuts, I will clean up the bottom of this dovetail dado thing. Then a little touch up with an eighth inch chisel. And then I'll break the edges with a low angle block plane. And now back to the router table for a final round over. Notice I set up the fence this time. That's because the bearing on the bit would actually extend up into the dovetail dado thingy and completely mess it up. So these will hang on the wall. This will be the mounting strip. You can see it's a French cleat is how it's held on. And they just kind of can be moved around wherever. But yeah. Pretty cool. Now for a quick counterbore. The more important part here is the counterbore on the wall plate. That makes sure that the wall plate sits flat against the dovetail track and against the wall. A quick test fit and assembly allows me to measure for the screw holes on the dovetail track. This way I can put holes in the track and then hide them with the wall plate. I'll set the depth and drill the five holes for the dovetail track.
and then I'll counter bore. I'll sand all sides of the plaques that are visible. So I'm gonna spend more time on the front of the plaque. On the back, since it won't be seen, I'm just making sure that it looks okay. For sanding, I'm using 120 grit to round over all the edges and smooth it out. Progressing to 180 grit to refine the surfaces before finally moving to 320 grit, which will more or less polish the wood a little bit and get rid of all of the previous scratches. Figured walnut, or really any figured wood, has a tendency to show scratches, so a higher grit is needed. The birch, however, is perfectly fine sanding to 180 grit by hand. With the face of the plaque sanded to 320, I'll take a router and redo the round over. I originally established the round over at the router table, but because the plaques aren't perfectly flat, a handheld router follows the contour much better. Then I'll just refine the edge with some 320, and then a puff of air to clear the dust out of the pores. I have an electric branding iron, and I find that it doesn't quite get hot enough. So I'll touch it up with the torch to make it just a little hotter. For about 30 seconds, I press down hard and move the branding iron in a circular motion to ensure good contact with the wood. On plaques, I like to use rattle can semi-gloss polyurethane. For the birch, I'm going to go straight polyurethane because I don't want to yellow the wood. I find that applying a stain or an oil will often yellow white woods, and that's not quite the look I'm going for. It seems every woodworker has their favorite finish. For me, that's Birchwood Casey True Oil. It's a combination of three things, or at least I think it is. It's an oil varnish, along with linseed and tongue oil. It's then thinned a little bit to make it a wiping finish. I find it easy to apply, and I'm very happy with the results. It enhances the grain of the wood without yelling it significantly like some oil finishes. To apply, I use a foam applicator and apply generously. Then I wait a few minutes allowing it to soak into the wood and I wipe it off with a lint-free cloth. This gives a smooth and consistent finish. The process for successfully boiling a skull is fairly straightforward and very disgusting. Let me go over it very briefly. So that's a quick recap of how I prepared the skull. And I'm sorry if you were looking forward to that. It was really disgusting. There were animal bits everywhere and I didn't want to get my phone covered in stuff. Yeah stuff. So anyway. So these are the skulls. They've been cleaned, whitened, and now they've dried for over 60 days. And if I zoom in, they look very clean.
And yeah, I did say phone. I don't have a proper video camera. This is a low budget production. Speaking of, I'm gonna use this blue rope to illustrate how I tie knots. First thing I'm gonna do is take apart the two pieces. We have a skull and a jaw. The string that I'm using is number 18 Mason's line. This is a white nylon string. I'm going to cut a piece about three feet long. And I'm just gonna use a lighter to do that. There we go. And I'll make a second one. First thing I'm going to do is tie a simple square knot. So I'm going to loop around here. And just like you were taught to tie your shoes, we'll make that first knot. And then a second. Also, if you remember school, this is called a double knot. Let me show you with the blue cord. So first I came through and made that. Then I came back around and tied that. Now with both strings together, one will go through this side and one through this. Now this one will be cinched up underneath here and cross over to this side. This one will then cross over to this side. And be tucked up underneath this joint. Now, we're going to loop up here and now this one will loop the other way. Okay. Now, the jaw is captured. Let's tie a slip knot. Now I will use the lighter and smoosh it down. Slide the knot tight. Then the tricky part, finishing burning it through without burning the bone. Let me show you with the blue rope now. So that final knot that I used to finish is called a slip knot. And this is how you do it. You loop around like that. And then you follow it back through. So that right there is a slip knot. You tighten it down and then I burned it off right here and that made an end. So the end couldn't fit back through. And because that nylon is slippery, that locks that rope. Then the next step was to slide the knot tight. So I pulled on this end here to slide it nice and tight. And then I burned through this part right here. So then both ends were locked in place and the knot cannot come apart. I gotta figure out what order to put them in. Say so I got four skulls now. We're hoping to get a fifth.
So the plan is to have everything on track. There is one empty spot. So hopefully next year we take care of that. And we can always move these around and put the biggest one in the middle. I really like how they turned out. Um, the string is pretty much invisible from uh, looking up at it. And I really, really like when the jaw is open just a little bit because it highlights the teeth and it looks so cool, especially this guy. This three and a half year old boar has fantastic teeth. Other than that, the older ones, yeah, still super cool. Very happy. And uh, yeah, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching, guys.